I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and today we're reviewing this beautiful green over tan Alfa Romeo Giulia. Aside from being painted in Instagram's most popular combination, this particular Giulia is actually a really special car and in today's video I'm going to be explaining why if you're considering a BMW 3 Series, Audi A4 or Mercedes-Benz C-Class, you should at least take this vehicle for a test drive before you sign on the dotted line. No, this isn't sponsored. No, I'm not an Alfa Romeo shill. I'm not even that much of an Alfisti. I just think this is a really lovely small luxury rear wheel drive car. Now, when it comes to the Giulia, the Tospec Quadrifoglio is the variant that gets most of the headlines. And I have driven the updated 2021 Giulia Quadrifoglio, and you can watch that video by clicking up here. This one is the two liter turbocharged four cylinder in Veloce trim. And in some ways, this is a really lovely car on its own merits. For sure, the 2.9 liter twin turbo V6 that you get in the Quadrifoglio is a very, very special unit but we've got so much less weight over the front wheels here in the Veloce. We've got an LSD on the rear end. We've got 206 kilowatts of power, so this car is hardly slow, and it's also softer and more livable than the Quadrifoglio. Plus, doesn't it just look gorgeous in this Viconti green over a tan interior? This Veloce is fully optioned, so we've got things like the five hole wheels, which look pretty cool in that dark gray. We've got optional black calipers, which just give it this really nice aesthetic when viewed from side on. And inside, we of course have that gorgeous tan interior and a bunch of other premium options that make this car feel really quite complete for the price. So let's start today's video by jumping inside the Giulia. Jumping into the Alfa Romeo Giulia, we find one of the great driving positions of any new car. You sit low, you sit into the Alfa Romeo Giulia, and your legs stretch right out in front of you like a proper rear wheel drive car with a long front end, just like this one is. Then you find that this lovely steering wheel is sitting at just the right place. You've got these tactile paddle shifters. You can rest your arm if you need to on either side. There's nothing about this driving position that makes you feel uncomfortable or that they haven't thought it out really well. And thankfully, the Julia's cabin goes well beyond that simple fact, or at least it does now. When the Julia and Stelvio first came out five years ago or so, their cabins were just a little bit ratty in terms of materials and build quality. You know, if you got into one of those and then went down the street to a BMW dealer and sat in a 3 Series, it was very clear that Bavaria had its quality control standards to a slightly higher level. That distinction is no longer anywhere near as evident in the Giulia. The facelifted cars are built better. They have less rattles. In fact, this particular car, okay, it's only got 2,000 Ks on the clock, but this particular car feels fantastic. And just, you know, there's no more shifting plastics in the cabin. Not just that, but things like the damping on the controls and the buttons have been changed to be heavier. And that reminds me of the old W204 C-Class where all the controls were just supposed to be four Newton meters if anyone cares, but you know, heavy enough such that it felt like you were in something hewn from granite. And here in the Julia, you now kind of get that impression. And I love that. There's also been some updates to the infotainment. It's got more processing power. Some of the software has changed. It's still not as uh, intuitive as Audi's MMI system or the BMW iDrive, but it's completely acceptable. And we have a rotary dial to control it, which is fantastic when you're on a dynamic bumpy road, which this car deals with so well. Then it's also a touchscreen and it's got like a matte coating on it so it doesn't pick up your fingerprints. We do have wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and this car has the grand or so optional Harman Kardon stereo, uh, which is cool and has nice little speaker grills on the doors. We've also got the optional dual pane sunroof, which I think a lot of people will want. And someone with great taste went for this tan interior for this press car, which is absolutely the way I would have it. I would have it just as you see it here. It looks perfect. It looks so much more special than any A4 C-Class 3 Series just by virtue of this standard color combination. You know, this isn't a special order. You can buy it just like this, like you would any other Julia. That's fantastic. We've got the Alfa Romeo crest up here in the headrests. We've got gorgeous tan stitching on this leather dashboard. It all looks the part, it feels the part. Lovely analog gauges, sure they're not as 
cool and sophisticated as an A4's digital gauge cluster, but for me, I actually prefer them this way on an Alfa Romeo. So, you know, now that the quality's improved and some of the fittings and fixtures have really taken a step up, there's nothing huge to complain about here. Sure, wireless CarPlay and stuff would be great, but you know, as it sits, I'll take it. Here in the back of the Julia, you find that this Alpha is perfectly adequate for carrying two more adults in the second row, which is really all this car has to do because there's not gonna to be too many people buying this as their only family car. But if you do that, you'll see that even for someone six foot like me, there's just enough headroom with the dual pane sunroofs, leg room behind my own driving position's fine. Tow room's a little tight, but I could certainly put up with it. You will notice this middle seat is a perch and really emergency use only because there's no floor space and headroom would be seriously compromised. But I guess the point is, is that you don't have to go for the Stelvio SUV, which is sort of the lifted wagon version of this car, I suppose, just if you think you need backseat space because there's enough of it here in the Julia. In terms of amenities, we've got air vents, those cool aviation style things. Sure, the trend is dating a bit now, but I still sort of like them. Uh, heated rear seats as well as up front which is nice two more usb ports here map pockets flip down armrest with cup holders very nice and still that lovely leather lined trim up here on the doors here around the back of the alfa romeo julia and again in my subjective opinion this is a handsome vehicle styling is always subjective and you can let me know down below the video whether you like the julia because it is a little bit polarizing but for me it just wears this green paint so well and the veloce's dark gray like gunmetal badges look really good on it as well now we've got these twin outlets here around the back for the veloce we've also got a q2 badge uh, which means that this car has the limited slip differential on the rear axle. Now, the boot itself is manual, which is fine. I don't really understand small sedans with power tailgates. And that boot opens up to reveal a 480 litre boot, which is about par for the course for this segment. And as you can see, we can get the three chasing cars suitcases in here just fine. You don't really need to go up to the Stelvio SUV. Now, getting these cases in here requires kind of like the vigor of a I don't know, Alitalia flight attendant on a Friday night, Roma to Milano. But you can get them in there. You've got remote releases for the 6040 folding back seats, but underneath that boot floor, you won't find a spare on this car. So you're gonna be taking your life in your hands going country touring in this thing. But for me, I think I'd probably take that risk because as we'll find out shortly, this thing is brilliant to drive on a country road. Now, so far so good on the Julia, there must be a catch, right? Well, there sort of is, and it comes along in the running costs point of view or the general ownership proposition of this car. And that begins with the warranty, which is three years, 150,000 kilometers here in Australia. Now, rivals like the Mercedes-Benz C-Class give you five years with unlimited kilometers. And let's face it, when you're buying an Alfa Romeo, slightly longer on the warranty front is something that would probably help you sign on the dotted line. Similarly, servicing is on the pricier side for this car. It adds up to $2,865 across five years and 75,000 kilometers, but those services are capped for that length of time. And in terms of fuel consumption, the two liter in this car is really quite punchy and good as we're about to find out, but it's not the most efficient in segment. It'll give you around eight or nine liters per 100 Ks in combined driving. Something like a BMW 330i is considerably more efficient. But with all those details out of the way, let's jump into the driver's seat of the Giulia Veloce. So what really makes the Giulia Veloce so special? It's the driving. So let's go do some. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, it's the Giulia Quadrifoglio that typically gets the headlines when it comes to this car. The Giulia hasn't sold as strongly as Alfa Romeo and Stellantis hoped that it would. It's a bit of a cult favorite, but out of all of the variants, the Quadrifoglio with its, what some people refer to as a cut down Ferrari V12 into a 2.9 liter twin turbo V6 tends to be what people focus on and the Quadrifoglio is a brilliant car. It recently copped a discount here in Australia, so it's now you know, quite affordable compared to something like a BMW M3 or Mercedes AMG C63, and you should check out my review of that car. But to regard the Veloce as, you know, 
cheaping out and not going for the Quadrifoglio would be to completely miss the point of this car. Even to regard the Veloce as a mini Quadrifoglio would be to, again, miss the point. And that would be because the Veloce is a charming car on its own merits. There are some things which are quite similar to the Quadrifoglio and you can certainly tell the same spirit is infused in the engineering of this car and in the dynamic priorities. Things like superb damping that makes the car a great fit for Italian and Australian back roads alike. Things like steering that actually communicates with you as a driver. Those assets are shared, but the balance of the car and the way it responds to you is quite different and really quite special again in its own regard. But first of all, let's just start by going through the basics of the mechanical package. So we've got a two litre turbocharged four cylinder petrol engine under the bonnet. That's something that you hear coming out of my mouth an awful lot because as the internal combustion has reached its peak efficiency and probably the peak of its development ever, as we know, how EVs are being pushed down the pipeline, kind of whether we want them or not. But the two litre in this car is really an example of a best of breed engine. It's between this and the two litre in the BMW 330i that take class honours and then the A4 45 TFSI Volkswagen EA888 engine would be sort of in second place. But here in the Alpha, the numbers are actually quite good. 206 kilowatts of power and 400 newton meters of torque. So that's a little bit more than you get from most of this car's rivals. The only exception really would be the Jaguar XE P300. Uh, but sadly that car, the engine isn't particularly characterful. Uh, it's powerful, 221 kilowatts I think, but it doesn't sound great. Now the Julia sounds pretty good here in the cabin. Uh, it certainly doesn't have the oral symphony that the Quadrifoglio has, but that's a completely different ball game and twice the price, pretty much. But the two liter is pretty good to listen to. But what's special about it is how responsive it is. It's like an old school Atmo engine. You get all the benefits of turbocharging. It's a strong car. You know, there's muscle everywhere, but it wants to rev and it really comes alive underfoot. <laughs> oh, there's plentiful torque for rotating the car on throttle, but I'll come back to that characteristic. The other thing that makes this engine and the entire drivetrain of the car so special is the beautiful partnership between the two liter engine and the eight speed ZF automatic torque converter gearbox. This is one of those engines that makes you forget that manuals exist. Now, don't get me wrong, I love a great manual car. And there are many cars, oh yeah, many cars where the manual is the gearbox you'd want. Now you don't have that choice in the Julia, but that's okay because the auto is superb, superb. The engineers have managed to tune it even better than BMW's job on the same gearbox. It is imperceptible when you want it to be, when you're just cruising, you don't even know it's there. But then when you're driving it dynamically on a great road like this, it's like a sixth sense. It knows what gear to be in, so you can leave it to its own devices, or you can take over with these gorgeous, cold, column-mounted paddle shifters, where this engine, uh, sorry, transmission, I should say, is so snappy. You know, I'm glad they didn't go with a dual clutch. You just get this gorgeous, smooth, silky auto and you can drive it the way you want it. But the engine and gearbox are actually not the best part of this car. The absolute flagship attribute of the Julia is the balance of its ride and handling, but the clarity of its ride and handling. It's one of those things where I can tell you about it and you can listen and get an understanding of what it's like but truly understanding the beauty of the Julia comes from the driving and a test drive where if you can get a little bit away from the dealership and you can find a good bit of road, 80, 100 k's an hour bit of road, twists and turns, you'll get it, you'll get it. 
So it starts with the steering, which has a quicker ratio than most rivals. The A4's ratio is also pretty quick, but I think the Julia's is faster. So you get immediate response off center. Totally natural ratio, really good rack. Placing this car on the road is so easy and natural. It's not a big car, it's not a heavy car, it's lighter than some rivals too. You can see the edges of that bonnet. You have mirrors that help you place the car as well, but just, you know, the adjustment that you can get through the steering wheel is just so precise. Plus we're on good tires, Pirelli P0 is staggered, a little bit wider at the back. Now we're at the front, but turn-in's really good. The fronts could probably be a touch wider and so if you're cornering really hard and with you know serious force of course you will run out of grip at the front end but if you ever want a car that defines steering with the throttle at least a modern contemporary car it would be the Giulia Veloce. When you start running out of help from the front wheels just gradually feeding in throttle you get this gorgeous linear correction coming from the front end. And I don't even mean big Larry slides. I just mean the feeling of torque coming through that outside rear wheel and just correcting your line and putting the car straight. So you've got gorgeous steering through the steering wheel and then you've got this beautiful linear, easy to understand control coming from the rear wheels too. And of course that's influenced by the standard fit limited slip diff that you get on the Veloce, which really elevates this car's feeling of control over the base Julia. So if you don't want to go all out on a quadrifolio, which is understandable, I mean, it's expensive, very expensive for pretty much anyone. And it's a Larry car, you know. If you want something a bit more subtle like this, go for the Veloce. Forget about the base car, go for the Veloce. It's got more power than the base car. It feels more balanced, but it's also got that LSD, which makes a big difference. Okay, the ride. We've got adaptive dampers on the Veloce as well, and as I mentioned, we're on the 19-inch wheels here. I would not go for the 20s, just stay on 19s. They look, they do look big enough. Aesthetically, it's fine, but they just give you a little bit more absorbency through the tires. But the damping's also good. Now, we've got uh, two settings for the dampers, a softer and a firmer. Day-to-day -day driving, commuting, the soft setting's what you want. It's got that real pliancy, soaks up bumps really nicely. It is, it's noticeably soft-ish, but not in a wallowy way. Body control is acceptable, more than acceptable really. But then on a road like this, the firmer dampers are what you want because they're not stupidly firm. Like so many cars that have a sport damper or a firm damper setting, you know, it feels like it was designed for some glassy back road in Portugal or something not the Julia. Here, the firm dampers are clearly designed for back roads, which are not maintained that well. And we have a lot of those here in Australia. And maybe they have a lot of them in Italy too. So you get absorbency, but what you get is fantastic body control. The car just settles immediately. In the softer damper mode, you do get a little bit of that nice bob, like just one bob after a bump, just to round it off. But on a road like this, you don't want that. You want immediately the car to settle because you've got to turn into another corner or something you know there's no time for that kind of nice plushness you just need settled and that's what you get but it's still comfortable so are the seats they're gorgeous seat just firm enough but yeah the one comment i would have about the dampers and about the ride and handling setup is unfortunately there's no individual mode so you can't have natural mode with light steering and the firm damper can only have the firm dampers in dynamic mode which means the steering takes on extra weight now usually I criticize that but actually on this kind of road a little bit of extra weight to the steering is welcome the natural mode steering is quite light now I like that in day-to-day -day traffic but what it means is you've actually got one mode that works really well for your everyday commute and then you've got another mode which works really well for a back road blast you know it's a treat for me to review a car like this because we, we review a lot of good cars. The market has a lot of good cars. It's really hard to find a genuine shitbox. 
but then something like the Giulia Veloce comes along and it reminds you of where the high highs of this industry are. And given that you can get into one of these for what, 80K with all the options before on-road costs, I'm not pretending it's cheap, but man, it's a lot of pleasure for that kind of money. Other stuff, refinement, not too bad. I'm on course chip doing 100 right now, you can hear me. The P0s are a sporty tire, they definitely contribute to the noise, but it's totally bearable. Um, the temperature, I find myself fiddling with the temperature quite a lot to keep the temperature at the same level. It's either a little hot or a little cold in my experience. But I love this cowl here, gorgeous stitched leather cowl. Keeps the touchscreen in shadow all the time. It's nicely integrated. We've got real climate controls. The tactility of the interior is special. And that's something that they improved with the recent update to this car. Safety, it's subtle. You know, it's not as not on the same level as BMW's intelligent drive. The lane keep doesn't keep you in the middle of the lane that well. But it also doesn't annoy you. You know, it's not always bonging and binging. And if you do start driving out of the lane, you just feel a subtle little vibration through the wheel that doesn't embarrass you in front of your passengers like so many cars do. So I don't mind, I think it's good. The adaptive cruise works. We've got blind spots, we've got a pretty crappy reversing camera. It's very low res, but it works. Good driving position, the view out is good. Hopefully that sums up my thoughts on the car. You know, I'm thinking about a last great new internal combustion car myself. And this is on the list. So that's my detailed opinion on the refreshed Alfa Romeo Giulia Veloce. As this video has probably made clear, I think this is a pretty rad car. But why do I care so much about cars like this? Well, I'm starting to talk to my friends about buying their last great internal combustion car. It's very clear now that electrification is, is galloping over the hill and it's gonna affect the kinds of cars that we can get in Australia very soon, as in the next few years. It's unclear whether or not you'll be able to buy a car like the Julia, particularly if it comes from Europe, where their emissions controls are really biting hard on what they're able to keep building and thereby send to markets like Australia. So if you're thinking about buying a sporty combustion powered vehicle, now is pretty much the time to make your mind up. And this is a car that deserves consideration. Let me know what you think though, below this video in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.